Hello, this is Paul Palmer and Natasha Todorovic Cowan. Great to see you, Paul. How are you doing? I'm doing very well, Natasha. Glad to be back having another chat with you. Same. Um, you've been really super busy, which is a good thing, but I've missed chatting with you. Yeah, I've had a lot of um a lot of training actually. Um a lot of people, several different aspects of training to um to support companies with. And um, one of the things that often comes up is, is how can you be sure that the training is working? And what's the level of competence um, with the people that, um, that you're training? And I have a question is, why are you doing competence assessment? Why don't you just measure how long they take to read the SOP? And I thought, well, what does that tell you? Mm -hmm. If they take six hours to read a four-page SOP, is that better? Well, yeah, right. Are they studying it? Are they memorizing it? If I go through it in five seconds and toss it, does it mean I uh, skimmed it? Does it mean I care? Does it mean I understand it? Who knows? You're right. <laughs> yeah. And I think a lot of the time, because of the way that the SOPs are designed, mm -hmm. um, to be oversight rather than detailed but right. then 20 30 pages of oversight and then you still have to move on to the work instructions for each separate section makes it quite difficult for people to actually um engage with it and develop from it because they really they really don't You, because they're not because they're not getting the level of detail, the 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 content of initially is ambiguous. Well, so, then you've also got the way people interpret the words. Uh -huh. Because the meaning of words for one person is different for another, and then how do you apply that in this particular context? Yeah, the that's actually an interesting point because. I work with people from a lot of different nationalities. And one of the ones that often comes up is the difference in terminology between the UK and the US. Mm -hmm. and, and people say real English or true English or natural English. And then I say, well, it's still English in America, but it's different words. Yeah. You talk to somebody in Australia and they tend to be closer to the UK's English. Mm -hmm. They struggle just as much with the language, a language barrier between English and English as they do with a language barrier between English and French, for example. And I, I quite often I find that really interesting because I spot the differences on purpose. Mm -hmm. and listen out for the um, ambiguities. Mm. And um, one of the one of the recent ones was uh, is actually object pronouns. So I really have a thing against using object pronouns if you haven't defined what it is you're talking about. Oh, yeah, I can do hours on this conversation, Paul. <laughs> so, yeah, so if, if you're looking at our backgrounds and wondering, um, Paul's got this really cool evolutionary background that's kind of black, white, and gray. And I love that evolution of the human with the impact on the environment and the the um colorful spiral i have is also a developmental human spiral um, meant to show how um, people develop through various levels and ambiguity and development are linked uh -huh. and i'll tell you how um so the the you know um sort of okay, let me get my fingers going here in these levels of the spiral ambiguity is very difficult for people to tolerate mm -hmm. and as we're kind of going in um you know this this direction of the spiral ambiguity is easier for people to um tolerate and work with and the way you work with ambiguity um, tells you how you're going to get work done, how you're going to lead a team, 
how you're going to impact that team and what they're going to produce. And so it's critical to understand the developmental factors in your organization because that directly impacts how people lead, how they follow instructions, how they interpret instructions and what they do as a result. Mm. I think the interpret instructions is very, um, very strong in the pharmaceutical industry because you'll find that the same words in different, um, even different departments within the same organization mean different things to them. So should, should is one that I don't like because, well, it says should, so we don't have to. <laughs> it's not must, it's should. So we can forget about that one and, and leave it to somebody else. Okay, so you're reminding me of, of a friend of mine who goes over um, city planning documents and shall means must. So she keeps going on how shall means must. It does. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. should doesn't. For some people, though, should does. <laughs> Which country? <laughs> um, it again spiral wise how are you interpreting the words yeah because for some a should is an absolute it's a must and it's not questionable for others it's a yeah we can finesse this around the edges because it's a suggestion mm. it's not a rule so we should all get vaccinated yes, exactly <laughs> <laughs> but if we don't really feel like it this week, let's not bother. Something like that, exactly. <laughs> yeah. And, and that, again, that is A, developmentally, how you interpret the rules or the words, how you translate it in your head, and then what you choose to do as a result. It's all developmental. Yeah. Yeah, you just made me think about some the way that the government's approaching it in that they, we advise you to continue with the restrictions even though we've lifted them. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so politics is a whole other animal. <laughs> uh, yeah, I know, I know. That's where you can make all the sides that hate you happy and you give yourself wiggle room to get out of it somehow. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but if we if we go back to the to the training topic and the ambiguity and the mm -hmm. and the, the way that things are written down, I do find that a picture supporting the words is often the best way to actually get things understood. And I know they say a picture paints a thousand worlds, but I think the way that pictures are interpreted is different, is. and they can reduce the level of ambiguity. Um. I can talk to you about this for hours and include assessment in it and and all of that. Um, when it goes to when it goes to training, you know, which is where we started our conversation, we can't just train and leave. We have to do some beginning work. We have to do the work that we do together. And then we have to continue to make sure that that work is understood, interpreted, and then implemented properly. Mm. And so proper training means following that life cycle, which is prepping, doing it, and then following through to make sure it sticks and the behavior changes happen and the understanding is there. And the only way you can do that is by having an ongoing relationship. So does that mean you shouldn't get outside contractors in to do your training and then let them go away? Um, I'm not saying that at all. Um, <laughs> of course I wouldn't say that. Um, <laughs> what I'm saying is too many organizations see the, the training as the magic bullet. Yeah. They're self-diagnosing. They say, I need a, you know, whatever training. And then as the trainer, if you get in, you'll deliver what the client wants. But a good consultant will go through with you and say, no, what you need is um, we'll do an analysis. 
we'll look at what your actual needs are and what the problems are. And it may involve a component of training, but uh-huh. that's not the silver bullet that solves the problem. That is a part of the entire uh, project that helps you get to where you want to go. Yeah. That's my preferred approach. And you know that and you do that. Yeah, I know. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I know. I know. And, and it frustrates me when people just go and do a, a day's training and think that they're perfect in it afterwards. Yeah. Um, yeah. We're, we've done the training, we've got the certificate, so we're the best thing since sliced bread. Yeah, no, that's I it. Don't like. that's, that's a license to begin, maybe, yeah. with caution. <laughs> well, it makes me think about the, the training that people go away on that says, oh, um, we need to understand why we've got problems with our temperature management system. So I'm going to send one person away on a one-day training to understand temperature systems. And then when they come back, they're going to fix the whole temperature management in the whole of this organization of 10,000 people. Um, Yeah. And then they come back and they're eager and excited to do what they were tasked to do. And the organization stops them from doing it. Yeah. And then they leave. And then they leave because they got mixed messages. Exactly. Well, I think we need to leave it there because I can feel myself going on to a qualified person discussion and that's a long discussion. (laughs) Okay, Natasha, nice to see you. This is Paul Palmer and... Natasha Todorovic-Cowan signing out. Have a good one.